for me, as as much as I'm willing to go there with John, with whatever he writes and and whatever whatever he wants to do, um, there's definitely a, I think an element of the band that 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 isn't only me, but wants to say accessible to a certain extent uh, be, because we're trying to make zombie takeout. What's up? Welcome to episode 414 of Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Podcast. I'm John. And I'm Scotto, and uh, it's good to be back. Oh, yeah. Uh, we needed an extra week because both of our <laughs> lives got a little hectic last week. Um, yeah. Really ironic that you were the one reading that line. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it to is, that it's, later. That's really funny. Um, first off, I have... Before we get to the movie, just wanted to say happy Disability Pride Month. Yes, it's a thing. Google it if you haven't heard it, heard about it. You'll, it'll probably be quite enlightening. Um, also, I realized something over the break. Um, so last summer was kind of ruined for me for because of some family medical issues. Mm. This summer, kind of ruined for everybody because it's what? fucking what 2020. And I, Are you I, saying these are special times? Well, I realized something. Um, what? 2018 was the last summer with a Sharknado movie. Fuck. I mean, I'm scientifically minded enough to know that correlation does not equal, you know, causation. I'm not. But in this case, it totally does. I mean, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that they should reboot <laughs> the franchise to save the world. I'm just saying it's something that they could do. And would it? I, I I was almost gonna say would it kill us to do it, but I, I shouldn't say things no, no, like no. that anymore, um, should I? No, no. <laughs> um, and we've got like almost two months of summer left. I'm sure they could slap something together. Have you seen the um, the the little video online of the bird who just picked up a shark out of the, out of yeah. the ocean and flying around with it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how it starts. Um, one last thing before we get to the movie. Sure. Do you remember a series from the early 80s called Wizards and Warriors? Fuck yeah. <laughs> Disappointed by it, but, you know. <laughs> I found the first episode on Daily Motion. Um, I'm thinking maybe a TV show episode just talking about the first episode. Maybe. I mean, I remember being disappointed by that as a kid. <laughs> I can't imagine liking it as an adult. <laughs> All the more reason it could be fun to revisit. Um, right. It's Jeff Conaway, Post Taxi. Julia Duffy, around the same time as um, Newhart. Oh, wow, really? That's they both popular. started in 83. Um, oh, yeah? And Clive Revel, the original Palpatine. Oh, wow. Uh, so, yeah, it might be... It, 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 I'm not saying it's going to be any good. I, I watched some of it the other night. Um, but it'll be fun to talk about. So we'll probably do that in a couple of weeks. We have some two-parters going on both shows. So first week of August, we'll prob- maybe we'll take off from the hearing and do the TV show instead. Something like that. I'll probably need a week off in August anyway, but okay. we'll, we'll get, get to that later. <laughs> All right. So without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 2011, How to Grow a Band. This kicks off a July documentary two-parter. Yes, we still can fit them both into July. Yes. And, of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by Artistic Vision. Who needs an audience or even a paycheck when you can just stubbornly follow your own artistic vision? (laughs) And also brought to you by Selling Out. It does actually pay the bills. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Did we just see too much of ourselves in this movie (laughs) for once? (laughs) Yeah. Um, he actually says never underestimate your audience, which has been our only rule for like nearly 30 years now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, that is something we've said many, many times. Like, fuck yeah, you tell him. And <laughs> but, we'll, we'll explain more how it relates to us as we get into the story. But the I, think, I think if you have listened long enough, they know. Well, we need to explain the movie before so they can know. There, okay, sure, sure. All right, so we begin with this uh, this guy who is he's uh, recently divorced. Actually, 
not that recently divorced, but recently enough. <laughs> um, he's kind of at a weird point of his life because he was a child, you know, prodigy, and uh, and really, I guess, a, a music star from like the point where he's like five or seven years mm-hmm. old. This is Chris Daly, the mandolinist from Nickel Creek, now Punch Brothers. Um, yeah, right. Nickel so, Creek was huge for a while there. I, I mean, I vaguely knew of them. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't even think I realized that that's where he was from when we were do, talking about Punch, yeah, Brothers Punch Brothers. And We reviewed one of their albums on The Hearing a couple years ago. Right. And so, you know, he... You know, they they won some Grammys. They you know they they rode the Oh Brother Where Art Thou you know mm. wave of bluegrass music that uh, came like what was it the late nineties I think oh, late nineties early thousands yeah so uh, he's pretty much playing this instrument for about twenty years and then he gets a divorce and for reasons that no one ever makes clear the uh, the band breaks up. Well, they he has said that they lost control of the machine. Right. And I guess you could see that. Like, they they were, you know, just going down a yeah. dark path mm. of, you know, commercialism. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and even they weren't even selling all that much anymore. So it was just kind of like a, why bother doing this, I exactly. guess. So the band breaks up. He, um, you know... His marriage is already gone. What does he do? Well, he still wants to record music, so he decides to put a band of his own together. But he's not just going to play regular bluegrass music, cause, and he's been playing it for 20 years, so hmm. why the fuck wouldn't he want to branch out? And Knuckle Creek weren't just straight up bluegrass either. They were a bit on the poppy side. Right, right. They were bluegrass going into pop, but he was... Uh, why not take bluegrass into the classical music <laughs> genre? So he assembles a quintet and uh, comes up with this. I I think he came up with this genre of of bluegrass chamber music. <laughs> and to clarify, because the movie doesn't say this, um, they didn't form for that piece specifically. They all played together on his fifth solo album, which was the year before. Um, had a girl, a woman from the ground, which is where the name of the movie comes from. Oh, right, right. He pulled uh, them together to play in a solo album. Yeah. And then he wrote The Blind Leaving the Blind. I love that title. A <laughs> four movement suite for bluegrass band um, that, you know, is all about his divorce. Right. And um, which, like, like I said before we started recording, it was a very. Very Phil Collins yeah, yeah. thing because his whole first solo album mm-hmm. is, or actually, the first two solo albums really are all about div- his divorce. Yeah, I was very surprised when I found out that he improvised the lyrics to "In the Air Tonight" because it seemed very much about a divorce. Yeah, it's just his feelings that he was letting out and, right. and playing around with the recorder. But this, this is much more. I mean, the lyrically, it's it's about the divorce, but right. musically. I mean, when it's, you have John Paul Jones like yeah. coming out and being like, "Yeah, I'd like to do something like this," kind mm. of thing, like wistfully talking, the fucking bass player from Led Zeppelin, like, "Oh man, like I'd love to do something like this," kind I of mean, just the admiration he's talking yeah. about it. I mean, I'm a big Punch Brother fan. Have been for a couple of years now. Um, these guys are five of the greatest music six, if you count both bass players, of the yeah. greatest musicians on the face of the planet. They just happen to play instruments that aren't known for virtuosity, virtuosity in a couple of cases. Right. And so he's taking this, he's pretty much doing what the prog rock guys in the, you know, late 60s, early 70s did of taking, well, what if we took this attitude with rock music to this? Right. Uh, um, and, and so he, the, the ballsiest thing you can do and I tried to quiz my Mrs. Scotto mm-hmm. about where would the last place on the planet be that you would want to play something this experimental with bluegrass music? And uh, the answer for their first concert, Scotland. <laughs> Which is interesting because England is infamous for having a very open-minded music scene. Um, Hendrix broke in England the first time. Um, 
Tony Levin has said, you know, when he plays gigs in the U.S. and sessions and such, all, all they care about is him staying in the groove. When he plays in the U.K., you know, does sessions there, they want him to do something interesting. But that, that's different, though. That was rock and roll. Yeah, that's, that's rock and, and prog and all that. Um, this is bluegrass. Right. The the Scots and their and their bluegrass, they take that very seriously. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, yes they do. They they hold it very seriously to them. Just hmm. the whole, you know, mountain mm-hmm. culture. Yeah, yeah I can see the similarities. Definitely. I mean, my late mother in law had like, you know, Loretta Lynn albums and mm. just I mean <laughs> all all of it, you know. Okay. I did not know that American country and bluegrass were that popular over there. And so, right. So for them to go over there and, oh man, the, the first, one of the first scenes of the movie is, and I'm sorry, we're, we're so close to the beginning, uh, but it is him arguing with the promoter that they had just put bluegrass music on the posters. Yeah. Love that scene. At like you kind of knew he was fucked at that point, but you're kind of, th- but you know, what? you're thinking this is like a documentary and everything's going to be positive and stuff. But when they're playing the gig, and I'm looking at the crowd, I'm like, you know, this crowd, the crowd doesn't look like they're into it or something. You know, that's kind of odd that they're you know, you putting those shots in it. And uh, when they're finally done, just the dead silence. One of the most painful <laughs> scenes I've ever seen in a movie. Just, I think, do you know it'd be good to? <laughs> like, so I was just like, you went to Scotland. <laughs> like, some, I mean, he really should have started in the U.S. Yeah. somewhere, you know? Or, Probably or like Canada. New York or L.A. on the coasts where you a bit more open. Or even in England. Or, or Canada. Yeah. They, they Very, you know, like, forgiving audiences mm-hmm. in both these countries. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a tough crowd to start with, <laughs> to be your first gig. Oh, anyway, so um, after that, the, the entire crux of the movie, I think, well, uh, of at least this the foundation of mm. this band, it was in the quote that I used at the beginning. Um, mm. And it's uh, Greg Garrison, their, their original bass player, and... Um, when he said what he said at the beginning, that, um, that, that, well, actually, when he was talking about accessibility mm-hmm. on the ride up, so that was, that quote was even a little later. Yeah. But he was still harping on it at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was wondering why we couldn't break the suite up. Yeah. Pl- play, make things more accessible and play things uh, more shorter. And it's kind of like he had to have known what they were about before getting into it to get let's, this let's far power through this the summary before we get into specific scenes okay so right he's uh he wants it uh to be more accessible and of course uh pretty much the rest of the band is like no we just we're, <laughs> we're gonna play it the way it's fucking written and so uh, really the the problem with their first gig was it looked like they really hadn't rehearsed a whole lot and they were a little off <laughs> No, that was the music is written. I know, I know the suite. Uh, but I, they were kind of. It was the wrong crowd, absolutely. But I mean, and, and the just, audience, you know, being that dead threw them a bit, probably. Yeah, yeah, it, it did feed into each other. But uh, you know, you could see them kind of tighten up after that and rehearse. They rehearse. Mm-hmm. a whole fuck a lot more. Yeah, you know, a lot of the film is then them rehearsing after that. And practicing wherever they can, and just tightening it up. I, mm. uh, I mean, who knows if that was the actual audio from the gig, or if they were just playing the. Yeah, it was hard to tell. Go for it. Yeah. So uh, they they get their shit together. They they get a more, <laughs> you know, they get friendlier audiences, and they pick up steam, uh, so much enough that they, um, you know. That they they are a bit they have a bit of success off this album, mm-hmm. and uh, they tour with it, and really, I guess then they come back to the, um, they do like the whole year later yeah. thing, and uh, the bass player has, um, yeah, 
does not want to take the move with them to New York. Yeah, they, he, they decided they were all going to move to New York. The bass player is married with kids and it was already having issues with Ely. So he, he split. And uh, Larry and Seuss. Mm-hmm. And they opened with a scene that I think every music documentary starts with. The band <laughs> about to take the stage. Yeah. And then he, you know, they cut to, they start with the interview footage. And right away he talks about his divorce. Oh, yeah. Before they even do any background information on him. He's very upfront about it. Then yeah. I realized, I didn't know at that point, that it had been like, four years <laughs> at least yeah maybe five even by that point uh, and i love the piece they were playing in that opening scene very zappa um very oh, yeah, that, that guitar playing is just so yeah. sick at the beginning and he was i i, I swear oh, i heard mandolin him playing bending on a mandolin yes um, he totally was mandolins have pairs of strings tuned in four pairs of strings tuned in unison you play them, you know, as one. They're called courses. They're very tense. I play mandolin. Um, I don't know how the fuck you bend on one. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get the first really s- surprise, which you mentioned earlier, of, of the, the people they talk to. John Paul Jones. I was not expecting to see John Paul Jones in this movie. <laughs> and yeah, and just to talk so wistfully about yeah. like, oh man, I wish I could do something like that. <laughs> And You're like you said, when JPJ asshole. says that, because, I mean, the man is not only an amazing musician, but, I mean, he was I th- arguably more successful as a producer than he was with Zeppelin. It would have been like George Washington, like, I, I, I wish I'd founded a country. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you did, asshole. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you know, to... to for JPJ to say, like, I wish we could have done something that cool was is a huge praise. Yeah, it um, is. And I had no idea. I was kind of aware of Nickel Creek. I, I like one or two of their songs, but I had no idea they started as kids. Yeah, I mean, he... They, yeah, they did that with, like, the country music shows. Mm-hmm. If they found a kid that could play like that, yeah, they, they definitely would just throw him on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just what he could do at like twelve was amazing. Yeah, um, I mean, this is a guy who was literally a genius. He's won the grant. Well, yeah, he's he's a, he's actually won the MacArthur grant. So that's how brilliant of a musician he is. Um, I did get a little confused when John Peets, their manager, was talking about "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou," because he referred to it as a record. <laughs> And, I had to uh, watch that part a, little, a couple of times. Of oh, he's talking about the movie putting a spotlight on bluegrass music, I right? I think he was talking about the soundtrack specifically. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, that's why but I said it, Of course, the movie, you know, mm-hmm. if it wasn't for the movie, the soundtrack wouldn't... Uh, right. No, there wouldn't be a weird. soundtrack. Did uh, Pete look like a, a cult leader or a serial a bit, killer yeah. or, seer, or CEO of an internet startup company? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're all the same thing anyway, uh-huh. aren't kind they? Kind of scruffy, gray, yeah, yeah. Um, just that those intense eyes <laughs> yeah um loved the shot of the band walking into the venue during the when you hear the radio interview because gnome pekelny the ba- the banjo player is like three or four steps behind the rest of them carrying his banjo i laughed because banjos themselves resonator banjos are heavy they're like 12 pounds his the one he has is a vintage gibson top tension it's like 15 pounds that he has and, strapped to his shoulder every night. <laughs> did he like as he as soon as he walked in and they were setting up? He said, "Oh, I think they're having trouble hearing the banjo player on stage." Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to um, make sure mm-hmm. that they, he could be heard. I mean, upright basses are like fifty pounds, but you don't carry those on your shoulder <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> I would love to play banjo, but they're too fucking heavy. Um, and. I'm glad they did talk a little bit about how the band formed, but like I mentioned, it wasn't exactly complete. Um, they formed from the it during his previous solo album. Um, well, wasn't there a different member before that? Even before there's, this, uh, Brian Sutton toured with the, a guitarist toured with them from the so after on the, off the back of the solo album. Uh, I don't know why Critter didn't tour with him. Um, Critter is Chris Eldridge, the guitarist. I'm, I'm going to refer to him and Noam Pekelny by their nicknames. Um, Critter and Pickles, just because I have a habit of doing that. Yeah. Um, 
but it was nice to see it a little bit on how they were formed. And then 13 minutes in, we meet the antagonist, Greg Garrison, <laughs> the bassist. Because it really is about that conflict. Right. And I'm just confused. It's like he knew what, you know, Neil was going for. <laughs> uh, but there's a difference. Because he said he was down for doing, like, as getting exper- as experimental as you want on the record. He was on board. But when you play, you have to win him over. <laughs> we can do the weird shit, but we have to win him over first. And, you know, we've been alluding to the, how we kind of feel called out by the movie. Um, in, this, in our scenario, you're Chris Thiele, I'm Greg Garrison. <laughs> you always got to go want to go weirder and more obscure. I'm like, they have to get the joke. <laughs> Ah, no, I'm, they could get it some years down the road. <laughs> and just to have Feely flat out say, you know, um, what was the line? Um, uh, never, something about never underestimate your audience, um, which has been our rule all along. Never underestimate yeah. the audience. Um, you know, because we started with a student theater company where the director was really fond of the cheap joke. Yeah, you know. So and we we learned from that. Like, let's let's be interesting. Let's not go for the cheap joke. But then you really took that to heart. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'll throw a cheap joke in here and there, mm. <laughs> only when it's unexpected, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. And back to the movie. I, I loved uh, Critter's first date analogy. He said when they got and they first played together, it was like falling in love. It was like being on the best first date ever. I'm a musician. I've had those experiences where the first time you play with somebody, it's just magic. But, uh, you know, I'm with Chris in the argument still. Uh, it shouldn't okay. surprise you. you I'm know? very much with Garrison, as much as I deeply respect Chris as a musician. You know, when you make a suite, when you write a suite, you, you play it together. You know, you play it as a suite. They, they're, there's so many artists that, you know, they did concept albums and people are like, what the fuck? You're not going to actually just play this concept album together, you know? And, and yeah, you know, you want to get out there. You've It's your baby. Mm-hmm. And keep that. it together. But until you have an audience that is specifically paying to hear your particular brand of weirdness, you have <laughs> to win them over. Like, now they can do that shit. Because they have, you know, an audience who wants to hear them be themselves. At this point, they didn't have that. Yeah. You know, you got to win them over first. Um, I also, we talked about the scene where he had to correct the poster. Love that. Um, <laughs> they were billed as, quote unquote, hot bluegrass. <laughs> and he mentioned some other bluegrass band. I can't think of I can't remember the name. Um, but I'm assuming they were very traditional. And he, and he says, uh, now think of a band that plays the same instruments that couldn't be less like those bands you've met, just mentioned. Because <laughs> uh, it, it's like, you know, expecting, you know, um, Chuck Berry and and getting IQ. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and Gnome, before, right before the heckling, <laughs> they're about to walk out on stage and he says... We could always just make our living stateside if something really goes wrong. You wonder how often he said that, though. He did say that again. I think that was <laughs> his you know, thing when they went out on stage. Uh. But showing him say it right before that painful moment. Because <laughs> it really is every performer's worst nightmare. Yeah. You know, the audience just literally falling asleep at points and screaming at you. <laughs> And then he get on stage, and Chris flat out says, "We're gonna start with the forty minute suite, and about my divorce." <laughs> and I'm London, really right? nervous. Yeah. Oh no, it was Scotland where he said that. Yeah, that was, the Scot- that was the heckling. <laughs> In capitals, the heckling. Um, right before. I mean, he was. Yeah, they they weren't like into them when they first got on either. Like no. he didn't. Because he takes the stage and says, we're going to start with this 40-minute suite for string quintet. 
that I wrote about my divorce and I'm really nervous. And this is a guy who's been performing since he was a kid. Yeah. He really should have known better. <laughs> and there, you can actually see shots of like the audience falling asleep during it. <laughs> and then, as you mentioned, some guy yells out, you, you know, any good tunes. And, and then he says in between, oh, by the way, you can act however you please in between movements. We don't expect dead silence or anything. Whatever you want. You don't even have to clap at the end. He says this to a crowd that's already hostile. <laughs> <laughs> you can boo, you can clap. I mean, yeah, you can do whatever you want to do. You don't have to be silent. Like, after each, he couldn't have fucked that gig up worse. And like yeah, we like I said, we take the predictable sides in the argument in the van afterward. Um, Garrison <laughs> and Thiele were arguing about, you know, accessibility, and the argument was still hard to watch. Even this is the second time I've seen the film. I actually bought it after yeah. the first time I watched it. Um, and he yeah, there is there's the quote. Um, it's never a good idea to underestimate underestimate your audience. Um, you still have to win them over. <laughs> Um, and, um, JPJ, of course, that's when they went to JPJ again and said, you know, he, he was a fan right away. Um, and when someone on of his stature says that, um, and uh, they also had Yo-Yo Ma, as Yo-Yo a, Ma uh, um, who Chris Thiele has recorded with a couple of times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, another one of the, uh, cellist who's another one of the greatest musicians in the world. Um, and the movie kind of hints that they were going to split up soon. Like, the band as a whole. <laughs> like, a lot of people were not betting them to, on them to last. Right. Like, the other the other musicians were kind of leery about how long this thing was going to last. Mm-hmm. Like, um, is he just going to get another, like, flight of fancy and right. move on to something else? And they're still, with the exception of, you know, changing their bass player after that tour... They're still together 13 years later. So They're Probably due for another album soon, actually, aren't um, they? 2018 was the last one. Yeah. So probably soon. And speaking of the last album, just to, just for some contrast, their, their latest album, All Ashore, released in 2018, um, won the Grammy for the Best Folk Album last year, um, hit number one on the Billboard US Top Bluegrass Albums, number eight on the Billboard US top u.s folk albums and actually even made it the number 48 on the u.s billboard's u.s top rock albums i don't know how it made it on the rock albums i mean there's rock influence in their work of course but but the, the, i mean there's something that they aren't really mentioning that that i feel that that was missing from towards the end of the field film was was when they were ready to make the leap and move to brooklyn mm-hmm. to uh to really, you know, build a, an audience. Uh, the other musicians are, of course, nervous because I, you get the feeling Chris has, you know, a lot more money and is more financially yeah. secure it and can do these mm-hmm. things and just not have to worry about right. sales and, and uh, that. Where, whereas they are, you know... Because <laughs> Chris had years and years of success with, with um, Nickel Creek. Um, yeah. Well, the laundry thing that Gnome talks about at the end is not a money issue, it's time. Yeah. Because he wants to rehearse all the time. <laughs> yeah. Thiele wants to rehearse constantly, and it's like, when am I going to have time to eat and do my laundry? So do you think they're quarantined together right now? I wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> Working um, out something new. <laughs> in their studio. Um, yeah. Loved during the uh, interview, uh, the Chris, uh, the Chris's, the Alien Critter, talking about how they mess with the typical bluegrass rhythms and like throw in polyrhythms and such. Um, and they they mentioned that it's very much music that's conceived on paper, but it doesn't sound like it when they play it. No, well, I guess some of that stuff in in the well, some of the really avant garde stuff does. Yeah, the blind leaving the blind, you know. Mm-hmm. Had a very academic feel to it. Yeah, but, but some of the Rose they... app esque stuff. Yeah. And the seeing how young both Chris Steely and Gabe Witcher, the, the fiddle player, were when they started. They were both kids when they started playing, yeah. performing. 
really puts their skill in perspective. Like these guys have been doing it like as long as they can walk practically. Right. I think, I think all of them are. And in fact, I mean, the guy that replaces Garrison is mm-hmm. just yeah. almost as young already. He's actually only a few years younger than Thiele. Um, oh, really? Like four years, he looked, yeah. He just he looks, looks a, a lot younger. He looked like a baby. <laughs> um, Chris Thiele was born in 81. Uh, Paul Covert, the ba- new second bassist, is born in 86. So there's like a five-year difference. Huh. Um, yeah, I checked that because he does look so much younger. Um, well, he's, uh, uh, yeah, I guess he's like 22. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And right after Garrison was talking about how he wants the band to stay accessible, they show him Skyping with his wife and kids. Yeah. Which was a great way to set up the conflict that we're about to get into. And I loved Thiele's line. Uh, I think people felt like this was my flight of fancy that they needed to protect me from. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to get a little too weird at this point, you know, and, and they need to, you know, make sure I can pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> and he was actually advised against making the band a democracy, which surprised me. Well, right. I mean, th- there's a lot of people that, that say that a band needs a leader and needs to, you know, have one person, you mm-hmm. know, be that guy. And, you know, The Blind Leaving the Blind was his baby. He composed it. Every other original they've done, including on the first album, was a collaboration by the band. Yeah. Um. So everything else, everything aside from that, that there's been an original, has been collaborative, at least, you know, credited wise, in terms of how it's credited. I don't know who writes what. Um, I mean, a it, lot of people outside of music like to have this romantic vision of the band being this, you know, e- you know, egalitarian kind of thing. But most of them are dictatorships. <laughs> Well, no, it, it varies. I mean, you have some some clear dictatorships. Oingo Boingo was a dictatorship. Tull yeah. was a dictatorship. Um, you know, a lot of times you have a, the songwriters in the band making a lot of decisions. Um, right. You know, the Toxic Twins, Page and Plant. Um, um, you know, whoever writes the songs makes a lot of those decisions. But it's not necessarily a... Um, dictatorship per se a lot of bands do split it up you a lot of in a lot of cases you they write their own parts you know? if there's multiple songwriters in the band yeah. but you know a lot of them are just you've got the songwriter and maybe they'll let somebody else take a song or two you know mm-hmm. just out of you know the police there's <laughs> another one that comes to mind sting did the bulk of the songwriting um, right summer's got a song one song on every album um there are some that work fairly democratically. Um, Bandmade, for example. Uh, Konami, the guitarist, writes the music, quote-unquote. She writes the riffs and the chord changes. The rhythm section comes up with their own parts. The rhythm guitarist writes the lyrics. She works out the vocal harmonies with the singer. So the writing is fairly split up. I know a lot of bands who do work it out that way. Um, but um, I forget who was saying it in the documentary. Um, I think it might have been Jerry Douglas. Um, that there needs to be someone you focus on. And it yeah. can be the band. Um, or it can be, it's often the singer. Um, it, it is. It is most often the singer. The great bands, of course, have that one musician that, you know, people well, focus on. A lot of times it is. It can be the band, but they have to be seen as a single identity. Um, Zeppelin wasn't just Plant. Right. Or Plant and Page. Bonzo was huge too. Um, DPJ didn't get a lot of attention because he's a bass player. Bass players don't get attention. Right. And he liked it that way. Um, you know, for all of their depraved tour stories, you know, bat behind the scenes <laughs> stories, um, they always say that JPJ was the most depraved of all of them. He just never got caught. Really? Yeah. I he was the one who did the real, you know, for all of the, the wild stories you've heard about Zeppelin. J- they say JPJ did like stuff that was far worse, but he's just so quiet and so smart that he just never got caught. Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just assumed it was Bonzo or Page. Yeah. Um, but I also liked, we we're talking about the, the d- democracy in the band. Um, Gnome and Garrison... We're talking to Critter about Chris's tendon, Thiele's tendency to get that um, 
autocratic. They, they were starting to complain to him like he he likes to make a lot of decisions on his own. <laughs> but, and I guess yeah, sometimes it is impossible to steer with multiple people steering. It is. Um but it it depends on how you approach the writing. You know, if you do break it up with where people write their own parts, then it, everybody does get their say. Yeah. Um, even if one person comes up with the chord changes. Uh, and there are some uh, Punch Brothers songs that I can tell. Um, Three Dots and a Dash from their latest album. Starts with a, a, a banjo part. I'm sure Gnome walked in with that banjo part and said, you know, let's write something around it. Mm, right. You know. So he, there's a lot of times he, it's easy to tell it was written in pieces and people came up with their own parts. And if that's how the writing takes place, that it, it can work. Um, the different, it, it just comes down to there's how many people are in the band. In this case, there's five, so there can't be a tie. You know, comes down comes down to votes. Um, and um, I also liked the line um, when they're talking about that. I, I would rather do something that's truly co- collaborative, where everybody is being fulfilled, than doing um, something that's um, the most staggering, because like an an artist can be, you know, Thiele really would just want to impress people. True. And especially at this age. And I've been through that stage. I've been the guy who plays too many notes. Um, I don't know <laughs> if I've told this story. Um, when I was in audio engineering school, um, we, we got a bunch of us together to play on this, this recording of a song about a teacher who had passed away um, the year before. Um, and the proceeds were being donated to his family. And while we were recording it, I'm trying to work at a baseline uh, that the, the instructor like just steps on the top mo- talk back button says, John, stop playing so many fucking notes. <laughs> Cause apparently I was trying to be a little too um, Getty Lee <laughs> instead of just playing the roots. <laughs> I was playing bass on it. Yeah. Um, but so I've been through that phase and I can totally see that in theory at this stage. And I get it. But I also, you know, because I'm quite a bit older than he was at this stage, and I'm sure he would agree, at the, you know, he was a little too stubbornly arrogant at this age. Um, <laughs> you you got to do something that's going to keep everybody happy, including your audience. <laughs> you can't just serve your ego. Did like the nice contrast later in the in the movie when they when he walks out and says we're gonna play a forty minute string quintet, and the audience was actually into it. <laughs> they were cheering for it at that point. I thought that, or no, that's right. It was London where it was like you laugh. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm gonna do. But we're really doing it, and they were yeah. into it. Yeah. Um. It also took me like an hour to notice that the movie was broken into four movements, like the suite was. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't catch that until, like, the hour mark. Loved the extent, the, um, when they, they have, I think it's the third movement in the movie, they just play an extended, they have this extended section of them playing. I think they're prob- probably playing the third movement of the, sim- yeah. of the suite. Blew my mind. They're just incredible. <laughs> Seeing that, them just play it live. That is the takeaway from this. They, they, <laughs> You know, or a clearly talented band. And there's something really deceptive about Chris Eldridge, the guitarist's playing. Because, you know, I've been playing for 35 years. Or I started playing 35 years ago. I don't play much guitar anymore. Um, but I know listening, in watching, how complicated what he's doing is. But he just makes it look so damn easy. Like, he's the one who doesn't seem like he's as virtuosic as he is. And it That's true. amazes me. <laughs> It's just, so like, you, it sounds easy. Do you think the quote that he said to the reviewer was misquoted, or do you think uh, Chris really said that about him? I think he actually <laughs> said probably something along those lines. The, the, the interviewer probably patted it a bit. Right. What, what it was was that uh, he 
he's brave and you know he plays things that you know maybe he might miss right. but you know he takes the chance he's to willing do to it. try anything basically yeah uh, critter Thiele said this about critter he's willing to try anything and he's you know can pretty much play anything he wants so you know and and um Thiele kept denying it and saying he was he was misquoted and you know, I, th- I think he i think it was he was more joking uh Thiele, that he was misquoted because he didn't want to give critter a compliment <laughs> or at least not that much of one yeah um and then it jumps a year and we get garrison leaving the band it, it got very christopher guest i would love to see christopher guest remake this mm. <laughs> like just shot for shot yeah just take his cast uh-huh. eugene levy is chris mm. yeah <laughs> uh paul michael higgins i think we did we did this on air paul michael higgins as the other critter um Nice to see Paul Cowart, the second bassist, introduced at the end. Um, I was I listened to the first album a couple of nights ago, and then listened to some of their later stuff. There is a significant difference between the two. I had not oh, noticed yeah? it before. Um, Greg Garrison's playing is much more aggressive and much louder. Um, I noticed it because I had just watched a, a couple of interview with uh, Hawktail, which is Paul Cowart's side project. Similar band, instrumental, experimental bluegrass, um, except they don't have a banjo player. Um, there's only four of them. Um, and he was saying that he likes playing softly because you can always get louder. There's always more room for articulation. Yeah. Um, you start a lot, you start quiet. Um, and just listening to the two of them in comparison, Garrison and Cover, it is really striking that the bass really jumps out at you on the first album compared to the later albums where it is more mellow. Um, I also liked the Punch Brothers is sold out sign. Nice contrast from the heckling. <laughs> um, and but, the, and yeah. I think that was Carnegie Hall that they played. It was um, in New York, so it wouldn't surprise me. That that Well, there was the Brooklyn show at the end that they sold out. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. The little place. Uh, to, uh, yeah. That, that show in Carnegie Hall before that, it, it, I mean, you hear, always hear about Carnegie Hall and stuff, right. but that looked like it was just the lobby of Carnegie Hall, where it was like a stairway, mm-hmm. you know, platform and, and the windows behind them, mm-hmm. and everybody was just watching from the stairs kind of thing. That, that's really awesome. <laughs> and then the quote of the movie for me, um, I... W- I would say it's it's not so much to say that the most important but that it's the most important part of everyone's life this band because they keep saying things that are like dun 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 the band broke up a year later <laughs> <laughs> they didn't break up but just right. that arrogance from Feely saying like yeah the band is the most important part of everyone's life I mean, he could say it's the most important of his life, part of his life, and that, you know, for all we know, is true. But making that assumption about the other four. Well, uh, you know, in a way, he's saying they're committed to it, at least, well, yeah. you know. If he, he didn't say that, if he said the, you know, well, it's mine, and mm-hmm. people would be like, well. Oh, yeah, what about the rest of them, right? <laughs> yeah. I also loved his quote at the very end. Um, I'm trying to be more than I am naturally. Yeah. That was a great line. I think that, you know, that really does sum up the whole thing, was Mm -hmm. that, I mean, he could have just been churning out that that Nickel Creek music, uh, but but he, and what else could he do in music if he wasn't doing that, you know? He needed to go into a new direction. Yeah, he'd already done the pop thing, he'd had the hits, he was the heartthrob, he, he, you know, he did that. He needed to reinvent himself, and there's, you know, someone earlier in the in the movie talked about. There's a lot of talk from the the people they interview outside of the band about, you know, what bands need to do and to stay together and why they stay together. You know, they only yeah. stay, someone said they only stay together if they're making a lot of money. <laughs> they weren't. They really have never made a ton of money. You know, they've never been mainstream. Um, you know, um, and someone uh, at one point said. Um, Oh, I forgot where I was going with that, but um, oh, I totally lost my train. <laughs> well, they did. I mean, they did some soundtrack work, yeah, or yeah. at least sold some songs for soundtrack, mm-hmm. which is, you know, a nice payoff right. at least without selling out. If you're right. not, yeah. unless you're doing like a, you know, 
Huey Lewis Pineapple Express sort of thing. <laughs> right. But, you know, that's kind of, a, you know, just what he did. <laughs> mm. But, you know, there's a lot of talk about why bands stay together and why they split up. And it's interesting that they were really trying to hint that the band was going to split up. And a lot of people were betting against them. It sounds like most of the band members thought that this wasn't going to last yeah, that long anyway. True. Because when you're with somebody who is such a, an artiste, <laughs> you know, um, to kind of tip the hat of my, what have I learned? Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of it depends on their whim. Right. Like, it, you know, if you look at like Billy Corgan in the mm-hmm. early yeah. 2000s, yeah. I mean, that was, that was a whirlwind. Like, mm-hmm. you know, pumpkins ended in like oh one or and then and then he does this forms this other band in oh two they break up while they're touring in oh three does oh, wow. a solo album and yeah it was was it jean it, or something like that zwan yeah. zwan that's it i always <laughs> wondered what happened to them like he broke up the band and like didn't like doesn't have the rights to the streaming you know uh-huh. didn't release it for streaming or anything right. uh, yeah it's wow. it's very weird <laughs> but yeah corgan's another case where he is he, and he he needs to stay interested or yes. he's gone <laughs> right um so he did this revolving door over yeah, like a five year case, span yeah, right or six year span and, and the original uh, pumpkins that's what they thought that, we're all pretty much the same except for Darcy, right? The lineup was pretty stable. Until, uh, well, yeah, Darcy left mm-hmm. after 97 or right. 98. And then, yeah, the, then the lineup became unstable after oh, that. Okay. Then it was a bunch of different people. Okay. She was kind of the first domino. Yeah. But I think he's gotten most of them back. Okay. Cause a lot, cause Actually, really... no, no. Wait a minute. That the, the the I think it's it's ebbed and flowed since. Because mm-hmm. that's right. I forgot Jimmy Chamberlain's gone. Oh, <laughs> I was wonder. I wasn't sure if their drummer was the one who died. Yeah. No. Um. It was like a keyboard player that oh, that, that right. like started the spiral. You know, okay. like the keyboard player died. Right. The keyboard player died, and then like for a door, Chamberlain was in rehab, so uh, that's why they didn't okay. really have a drummer. And, yeah, <laughs> uh, but a lot of that sound is really just Corgan and Eha. Exactly. Well, Corgan mostly, like mm. you know, well, but Eha's that, that, lead that, playing is a big part of it. In fact, the Smashing Pumpkins are the exact band I was thinking of when I was talking about a dictatorship. Well, they definitely <laughs> are. Yeah, it's it's Corgan. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Oingo Boingo was writer, Danny Elfman. Player, Every, the rest of them were, were session players. Um, yeah. So, sequels and remakes, you talked about the Christopher Guest thing. That would yes. be fun. Stat, Christopher Guest. I as, would like uh, to see. Greg Harrison. I'd like to see a follow up now. Yeah. Especially, yeah, I would not? love to see their reactions to this movie now. <laughs> <laughs> What's Greg Garrison up to these days? Well, I actually checked. He's in a he has a regular band. He's done a ton of session work, um, so he's he's still active. Um, the rest of them are all still together. I would just kind of get a kick out of Chris Steely looking back at himself at twenty six. Probably wanting to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Why was I so bad? Such an asshole. <laughs> Underbrains. A lot of brains. I love the band. I love the documentary. It it does. I do feel called out by it a little bit, but I'm giving it five. Ah, uh, this this was wonderful, actually. Five. I mean, the fact that they would they would include a gig that was so disastrous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just all of that is just so ballsy, and yeah. then just you know, sticking with your dream, you know, mm-hmm. sticking with your vision. Five brains easily. And what have we learned? Life is too short to make things accessible for the people that don't understand it. Fuck them. And just to be clear, because one of us is sitting in a wheelchair, we mean creatively accessible. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and I learned that, well, to, to reference Neuromancer, you can be too much the artiste. <laughs> 
And speaking of science fiction, um, that's it for How to Grow Band. Until next time, when we'll be reviewing what we left behind looking back at Star Trek Deep Space Nine. That'll be interesting. I've been catching up. I hope to be done with season two by the time we talk about the documentary. Oh, wow. So you're, uh, I got a ways you're to way go. before but I'm it finally gets good, getting, even. I'm getting to the Dominion more, finally. Okay. Um, really kind of getting in, really enjoying it. Um, so it'll be interesting to talk about, and I'm talking about the documentary. I'm sure there will be spoilers. Fortunately, I don't care about spoilers. Like the first season, there were definitely some train wreck episodes oh, yeah. there. No Star Trek series has a good first step, first season. I'm going with Discovery. It's super controversial, but I liked it. Um, there were definitely weak spots. I think that was kick-ass first season, though. I can't. I, I mean, maybe the original series had a solid first season too, maybe, but maybe. Um, I I've mentioned the, the Star Trek RPGs I watch, uh, Shield of Tomorrow, and now Clear Skies. When Clear Skies ended, or Shield of Tomorrow, the first one ended, I tweeted at them saying that it was the first Star Trek series with a good first season. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's it for ne- that's it that's next week until then of course always remember never forget wherever you go in life there you are there you are there you are